Welcome back to the Mike Huckabee Show on this Friday, the day after the 4th of July. Joining me now is uh, Dr. Judy Sasser, and Dr. Jasser is uh, a medical doctor. He is also a first-generation American Muslim whose parents uh, left Syria back in the mid-1960s. He's the author of uh, a terrific book called The Battle for the Soul of Islam, An American Muslim Patriot's Fight to Save His Faith. Uh, Dr. Jasser, it is a real honor to have you here. I always admire your views and you are one of the most uh, reasonable voices, I think, in the entire discussion of uh, the issue of uh, Muslim history and the Muslim faith. And I appreciate very much your being here today. Well, thank you, Governor. It's an honor to be with you. And I've also been a longtime fan. And uh, it, you've been also a voice of clarity in uh, times when, it, when others uh, aren't as uh, courageous. So thank you. You know, the the situation in Egypt is now boiling over with supporters of uh, Mohammed Morsi taking to the streets and already reports of some violence erupting, and uh, we hope it's contained. But this is a classic example of maybe the battle that we see in other parts of the world, and, and to some degree even among Muslims uh, here in America, as to whether it is going to be at a government level largely secular are a more radical Sharia law form of Islam. And and is that the heart of the battle in Egypt right now, you think? Oh, it really is. And I think if there's anything we're learning as Egypt tries to thread this needle, and what I mean by thread the needle is, you remember the first masses came up against dictatorship, against military secular dictatorship. And, you know, now we see ten times those coming out and proving to the world that we Muslims don't have it in our DNA necessarily predetermined to be under theocracy. And that ultimately you saw the millions come out. Uh, Nasser, uh, Sadat, Mubarak could never defeat the Brotherhood, but the only thing that could defeat it was themselves. Morsi did. And uh, he did because they realized that it really wasn't a democracy. And many of us are not really calling this a coup. I prefer to call it sort of Revolution 2.0 because the only part of democracy they had right was the election part. But then it became a autocracy of the majority uh, by election that then tried to fiat into place a constitution which really wasn't democratic, was more theocratic, a, a political system that really never empowered a parliament so they had no way to do a no-confidence vote, a foreign policy that reached out to Hamas and Iran. And, and unfortunately, the Obama administration that not only went to sleep, but made it seem like we endorsed the Brotherhood, leaving the Egyptian populace to feel that we were, again, supporting their oppressors. So, you know, as I talk about in my book, my family came here because we believe in religious liberty. We want a separation of mosque and state like we see in the Establishment Clause. And there are so many Muslims around the world that need to just sort of learn about that process, how you get from after 60 years of Egyptian dictatorship towards liberty. It needs some, you know, they're at a tipping point, but it may, they may not get it right. It may take some time. And to go in the right direction, they need some input from those of us that have experienced this in the West. I can only imagine the hostility that you have faced from people who feel that you've uh, not been faithful to Islam because you, you've approached it. And I, I don't want to use the term moderate theologically, but moderate in terms of practice. You want to practice your faith, and you feel free to do that in the United States, as you should. But you don't really necessarily want to have the government to enact a law that would force the rest of us to practice your faith. Any more, by the way, Dr. Jasser, than I would want to have the government... Uh, create a law that would force people to go to church with me on Sunday. Exactly, and this is the formula, the experiment that our founding fathers got so right. And as you know, it took 13 years between our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution. And, uh, um, you know, the, the experiment that Egypt is going through, you know, as I understood in my faith, my, my grandfather, one was a politician in Syria that was in and out of house arrest and understood political freedom. My other grandfather was a Sharia court judge and understood that you could have family courts, but yet not feel that that should be coerced, that once government coerces any type of religion, it's no longer religion. It's it's a theocracy, and it's, it's not by choice. Faith, by definition, is faith when you choose to accept it or reject it. And this is what really Muslims want to express. What was beautiful about the millions in the streets in Egypt, many of them were praying, some were secular, some were religious, but they were rejecting 
the 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 uh, uh, heavy-handed theocracy that the brotherhood said that they had God's mandate, and now as we see them try to reach now as their last gasp, they're reaching for violence because the only way they succeed is through martyrdom and a sense of victimization. The saddest thing, Governor, is that our advisors to this administration. Uh, have been very heavily weighted towards the Brotherhood legacy groups in the U.S. And if you ask yourself, why is our policy so screwed up? Unfortunately, most of those speaking for Muslims in America and in the West have been those very connected to the Brotherhood movement. So it makes it seem to us, and uh, living in this vacuum where the petrodollars fueled these ideas, that Muslims must therefore all believe like the Brotherhood. And we see in Egypt where they end up having their lives run by the Brotherhood, they don't want that. The majority don't. And not only Muslims, but the Coptic Christians, the women's groups, so many other minorities finally unified when they saw that they had to unify against the, the theocratic mindset of the Brotherhood. My guest is Dr. Uh, Zudi Jasser, and his book is called The Battle for the Soul of Islam. I would highly recommend it. And again, I want to say he's one of the most uh, articulate and credible people when it comes to uh, the practice of Islam here in the United States. Dr. Jasser, I'd love to know, what is the percentage, by your estimation, of the practicing Muslims in the United States who take the more radical Islamic view versus those who take the idea that, look, we're all here to be free. We don't want to uh, kill all the non-Muslims. Uh, we're not into uh, jihad. How does that break down in the U.S.? That's a great question, and I think it's very important, and we're getting more and more data now as we see what's happening in the Middle East, and especially in Egypt, and that the militants are really 5 to 7%. If you carve it out of age groups, it's more in the younger groups. Pew showed that um, out of the ages of 15 to 30 among American Muslims, 25% felt there may be some justification for militancy and excuses for al-Qaeda, which I find to be a frightening number. But the more important number is beyond the violence, which isn't an ideology, it's a technique. The, the Islamists, those that believe in the Islamic State, that look at the West as a secular, godless society, and it's painted that they don't understand liberty or they do understand it and find it as a threat, those numbers are upwards of 30 to 40 percent of Muslims. So this is a significant movement. That's why the Brotherhood won the elections the first time around. Uh, they had to go to a runoff. They only got 30, 40 percent of the vote in Egypt. And I think in the U.S. those numbers may be a little lower because there's obviously some impact of American Americanism upon Muslims that immigrate here. But so many of our immigrants aren't pressured ideologically. They come here for economic reasons and our government uh, allows them to claim victimization and maintain a separatist mindset. So those of us that try to debate them and expose their ideas are labeled as Islamophobes or, or other crazy things in order to prevent the debate from happening about what Americanism really is. So, yeah, I think it's 30 to 40 percent. And as we saw in the streets of Egypt, uh, I think that uh, left to their own devices, the Islamists will always lose that debate and hopefully they will end up in the dustbin of history. But it's going to take a lot of work, just like uh, the leadership we had under Reagan that pushed the Soviet era and communism towards uh, that direction. In the days following 9-11, I know that there was uh, a real need to say, look, not every person who is Muslim supports what happened in the terrorist actions. And uh, I was governor of uh, Arkansas at the time, and you know, I called in a large group of all the clerics in the state who were uh, Muslim. We had a major uh, visit, had a, held a press conference. I wanted to make sure that people didn't retaliate against people because to me, that would be doing exactly what we were upset and outraged over, is that a blind hatred and prejudice. And, you know, so many of the uh, uh, clerics of the Islamic faith in Arkansas at that time, I mean, they were just grief-stricken by 9-11. They were horrified because they knew that to a lot of people, they were going to be associated with that. So how how can you best help to change the uh, the image and the reputation so that, People don't assume that if you're Muslim that you must have celebrated 9-11. Well, that's the thing is is we need to be seen as leading the movement against the ideas that create these monsters. The the Boston bombers uh, uh, and, and movements like the Brotherhood don't get created overnight. There's an ideology that's supremacist, 
And uh, unfortunately, you see our White House, for example, meeting just a few weeks ago with Bin Baya, a Salafi scholar who's out of Saudi Arabia that has just unbelievably supremacist doctrines on his website. And it, if Americans saw us as Muslims countering that, speaking out against it and taking ownership of it, when Idal Hassan's trial goes on forever, why don't Muslims, instead of just complaining about Islamophobia, which I don't even believe exists, but... Uh, uh, and complaining about victimization, but rather lead and, and let Americans understand that if we're going to defeat political Islam, it's Muslims that are going to have to do that. So we're a major asset, if not the most important asset in that battle, no different than what created America against theocracy in, in Europe. Uh, this is going to have to be part of what we do. And, and I think it's, you know, wonderful governors like yourself who brought in you know, leaders to to make sure that there's no uh, backlash, you know, that's wonderful, but you can do that. We as Muslims, if we focus on worrying about backlash, uh, you know, I find it offensive that many Muslims, that's what they jump to is, oh, we're going to be attacked, etc. Meanwhile, our responsibility as Americans, they're shirking responsibility as Muslims to counter these ideas that are really, its as I testified to Congress and Chairman King, it's a Muslim problem that needs a Muslim solution. And so many Muslims have not been pushed and not pushing our leadership to counter those ideas. Either they're fearful or the leadership wants to advance political Islam and uh, we are just uh, not pushing them. It's what I have admired most about you. You've never... Uh, taken a defensive position, but rather a very offensive position, saying, look, I want to be the first one out there defining what Islam is and what it is not, and, uh, you know, a very reasonable and, and rational voice that is so needed. And, you know, I think sometimes we only hear from people from the uh, center of uh, American Islamic, what is it, care? I'm trying American to think. The, Islamic uh, relations. Yeah, and and, you know, they tend to be a little on the radical side and and not always very accommodating so it's refreshing when others like yourself are willing to take the stand and say you know we don't want to be defined by the radicals and you know i have two children i have three children and uh at the end of my book i have a letter to them and, and and it's all about legacy and this country gave me the ability to be myself and have an american dream and you know i look at what is supposed to be the seat of our faith, which is in Mecca. And when people go there, there's all faiths, all, all, all stripes of our faith, races, etc. But right outside that mosque is the most oppressive regime in the world. And, and to not see that as one of the major problems of a cancer that's metastasizing into terrorism and, and uh, theocracies and, and oppression throughout the Muslim world as one of the problems that we need to fix, we will not leave a legacy that shows that we appreciate American freedom. And, and I think the other thing is we need to look at solutions. We don't have a strategy. One of the things we need to have a conversation about in America in this century, what is our strategy against political Islam in Iran and Pakistan and Afghanistan? And, you know, we've, we've looked at militarily, but we're not going to have a military solution to this. So just like in the Cold War, we finally got the resources together, public and private, to say, you know, communism is an ideology we need to counter. And we finally defeated them without firing a bullet. Can we defeat political Islam without firing a bullet, with, with building a coalition of Muslims that get this so that we can begin to build a strategy? Al Jazeera spent half a billion dollars to buy a, a, a valueless uh, satellite uh, company from Al Gore because they want to get the war of ideas into the U.S. Are we going to counter that and stay asleep, or are we going to build a, a war of ideas? Well, I hope that uh, we won't go to sleep and, and forget uh, the incredible battle we're in. Uh, the book, again, is called The Battle for the Soul of Islam, An American Muslim Patriot's Fight to Save His Faith. A highly recommended read. I hope you'll get it. It's available on Amazon at bookstores. Uh, Dr. Zudi Jasser, the author and our guest. Dr. Jasser, great to talk to you again. I hope to see you again soon. Anytime, Governor. Thank you so much. God Thank bless. you. Uh, it, it, gosh, I wish there were many, many more voices like that of Dr. Jasser. He is a remarkable person, a great citizen, a great American, and, uh, you know, one of the voices that I think helps to bring clarity to the discussion. Because I, I, I know people that just assume every Muslim is all about terrorism, and that is so not true, and it's unfair. Uh, not just unfair to Dr. Jasser and people like him, it's unfair to 
uh, really to any civilized discussion. It's like saying that if somebody who goes to church does something horrible, then all Christians are just like that. Well, of course they're not. It's absurd. But at the same time, you can't make excuses for terrorists. And if the terrorists are predominantly coming from radical Islam, let's call it out and say what it is. That ought to be what we are doing out of the sake of honesty.